Hi, and everybody, welcome back. Good to see you all again on this wonderful Wednesday here in Jerusalem where it's dark and getting cold and a little rainy, actually, too, which is good for us here in Israel. Today, we want to talk about a very, very central idea, which is how to understand all of the violence, how to understand terrorism. What is behind it, after all? The terrorists are also human beings, right? Or at least they started that way. They come from Yishmoel. They come from the son of Abraham. What's going on? What happened? What is it that they really want? What, since we know that the Shorish, the root of everything, is in Kedusha, the root of everything is in Tov, right? What is the tov that they're looking for that has been derailed, that's gone so far off track to become so barbaric and so, so sick? If we can understand them, we can understand ourselves because we also have in us aggressive tendencies, although in a very different way. There's a Yalkut Shimoni, a Medrash that teaches that Esav will get a Tahara and that Yishmael will get a Rafua. What does that mean? Esav will get a Tahara we've been talking about over the last several weeks. That the good part of Esav, the Tov Sheba Esav, will be purified and will be cleansed. And Esav will join together in working with Yaakov to be able to bring the rectification of the world, to bring Hashem's light back into the world, to usher in the Messianic era, which is coming, which is very close. But what about Yishmoel? How is he getting a refuah? We have to understand that as yet he has no place in the rectification, the spiritual rectification of the world. We're going to see how he could have gotten the refuah very recently in history, but, but that opportunity was missed. Okay. Let's talk about what every soul experiences when it comes from heaven down into this world. Imagine, you're a soul and you're connected with the Creator. You're in complete, close contact, intimate, devakis, what we call devakis, oneness, with the Rabboni Sholem, with the Master of the World. You are feeling complete, you're whole, there's nothing missing. You're one with him, and all of a sudden you're yanked down from heaven into this world. Imagine what that would feel like. Well, that's what we all went through. That's what every soul went through. It was a tremendous loss. It's a tremendous sense of emptiness. And, in, and, and, and beyond what we can, what we, what we can comprehend. <clears throat> Deep inside every soul is a wish to return. It's a wish to return to that sublime feeling of connection with the Creator that we had in the beginning. And there's different ways of getting there. Is getting there in kosher ways, is getting there in ways that are approved of by the Torah. And there are ways that people attempt to get there on their own <clears throat> or by without the proper guidance that takes them further and further away from humanity, from, from being human and from acting human.
okay? This drive to be reconnected with Hashem can't be taken away. It's built into every human person. This drive to be one with Hashem once again and to, and to heal the split, that severing from Hashem that took us away from Him and that wanting to return back to Him, which Rabbi Nachman of Breslov calls the uh, force of return that there's a force, there's a drive in the human being to want to return back to its source. You know, we know that uh, even in nature, there are certain animals, for example, a fish, a salmon fish, wants to return back to its source at the end of its life. It can travel thousands and thousands of miles to get back to where it was born so that it can spawn there and die. Everything wants to come back, and under the right circumstances, a human being is going to be able to feel that relaxation and that calmness to enable that will, you'll actually be able to feel Hashem sort of beckoning the person back. Come back, come back, come back. Because Hashem is always seeking man, and, <clears throat> and when man is seeking Hashem, when a man is seeking God, <clears throat> You can see that God is seeking you, and it works. But when a person doesn't have that education, or a person has leaders that are violent and are committed to ridiculous doctrines that state that all apostates should be killed, what is an apostate? that all women should be stoned and executed for any alleged crimes, that gays should be murdered, that Jews should be murdered. Any doctrine in the name of, a, especially a religious doctrine, that calls for the extermination of people, of human beings, how could that be right? How could that be right? How could it be right that, a, that, a, that you only have three choices? That you can either submit to Islam that, or that you can endure, that you, number one, must submit. Number two, endure ridiculously humiliating taxes. Or three, surrender your life. How could that be coming from the one true God? It's impossible. Right? So what we have to understand is that there is a drive in human beings to relinquish themselves. There's a drive in all human beings to want to let go of the isolated self, the weak, worried, individual self that really knows deep down hey, I can't handle life on my own. I need to connect to something much bigger than I am. I need to be a part of something. Okay, if a person doesn't have that sense that that something is God, that person is going to try to connect to something else that's bigger than him. It could be an army. It could be a fascist movement. Okay, It could be some cult of violence where the person feels that by joining with that violent cult, that he's expanding himself and he's feeling more significant, he's feeling bigger than his little everyday problems. He's feeling bigger than his financial troubles or his problems in his home with his, with his marital harmony and so on and so forth. People need to relinquish themselves to a cause, to something bigger than, the, than they are. We see that, we see many examples of that. Um, people wanting to, uh, you go to, imagine, you know, a stadium where there's 30,000, 40,000 fans, you know, and you're now, you're a, you're a, you're a member, you know, you're, you're, you, you all have in common rooting for that team, you know. 
So you get 30,000 people screaming at the top of their lungs. And the team wins. And you feel that blissful state. It's a spiritual state. It's a spiritual type state where the person forgets his smallness, his, his insignificance, and he feels like he's a part of something enormous, something almost eternal. People look for this when they try to make a lot of money. You know, the addiction to materialism and to making millions and billions of dollars. What is it all about? Again, it's the experience, the state of almost e being eternal, of having so much power, having so much influence. For some, it's not enough to have millions. Even Hillary Clinton, we saw, had more than $300 million. And that wasn't enough. She needed power. She needed influence. She needed to be the most powerful person in the world. And that drive was so powerful that she didn't even think. It took away her seichel and her intellect. That with all of the scandals in her past, all of the illegal activities, all of the felonies, about 18 felonies that she's committed at least, um, that they would dig into her and that they would uproot these things. This drive to be more and to be connected to more. Very, very powerful. We see this very clearly today with our young people who are, you know, lose themselves. They want to lose themselves in music or they want to lose themselves, unfortunately, in... Uh, in drug and alcohol states, ecstatic states, states where people seek to feel ecstatic. They really are looking for God in the wrong places. Jewish people that are going, young people that go to India and go to Thailand and go to all these places looking to learn how to meditate and connect, it's all displacements of an inner drive to connect with God. We can see displacements and sublimations and people going in different directions looking for the right thing in the wrong ways and in the wrong places. This is what's going on today. <clears throat> people are definitely um, looking for this. The terrorists that are coming into the United States that have gone into Europe quite a bit already. These people are looking for the same thing, but they have become so sick that they're willing to blow themselves up because that's a, the ultimate form of sick self-nullification. That's a completely sick way of relinquishing and giving into that drive to be expansive and part of God, so to speak, by giving themselves up or giving up their children or sacrificing, you know, everything for some cause. But really, when we look at it, it that too isn't really a genuine sacrifice. That too isn't a really genuine surrender to even to their ideals. It represents most likely more of an escape of an escape, of a wanting to get away from, from a horribly meaningless life, from a life filled with terrible guilt about what they have done to their own children, to their own families, the mess that they've made of their own lives, and wanting to escape from it, get away from it, and somehow atone for it as well. So murder, violence, <clears throat> suicide. These are all very, very sick ways of giving into this need to relinquish one's das. What is the root of this? We said it's the trauma, in a sense, it's the birth trauma of being born. 
of being severed and taken away from God and brought down to this world. Well, God wouldn't just do this to torture a person. He doesn't bring us down to this world just to mock us and put us through all kinds of things that we can't deal with. There's a way. There's a way that we can be able to deal with this dilemma that we are born into where we want to return and we want to merge back with God. And yet we also want to be separate and become an identity and do our own things and feel like we're somebody too. There's a way of balancing these two extremes. One, wanting to merge, wanting to be one with God. And two, wanting to have an identity. Okay. Now, when you look at the person who goes too far, right? A person who gets caught up in the evil of the world, what he has to do is he has to deny God and he has to say, hey, there's no, really, there's no real God. Or if it is, a, if there is one, he's a God of violence and he wants me to do terrible things, right? He's a God who's only made, he, he only allowed me to be good at one thing and that's killing. So I'm going to be, get, become the best killer that I can be. I'll become the best drug pusher I can be, right? And the person's going to focus on developing those skills, right? <clears throat> the other alternative is to learn the meaning of Ein Od Milvado, which is there's nothing but God. And even though we do have a separate existence from him, our existence is completely tied to him at the same time. That we exist, but we're a reflection of him. We're part of him. And we can learn to enjoy being part of him, letting go, and being able to trust God. Now, here we come to a problem. The problem is trust. Most people today don't trust people very much. You know, it's hard to trust even people that we, that we know and that we, in quotes, love, you know. How many kids, to what extent do kids trust their parents even today? Your brothers, your sisters, your good cousins, your friends, your best teachers. To what extent do you really trust these people? It's hard, you know. A baby trusts his mother, but as a baby grows older, what happens? He starts to see that this is a very imperfect world. And he starts to recognize that he starts to feel the pain of betrayal. When people betray his trust. When people don't take care of him the way they're supposed to. When people lie to him or cheat him or make fun of him. Okay? How do you trust? So, we can't trust God anymore and let go of ourselves and let ourselves become part of a God. We can't do that really any more than we can trust people. I mean, if we can't do it with people, you know, people who we can talk to, people who we can see, people who we can sort of read what their motivations are, you know, are they friendly, are they not friendly? What's my, the history of my relationship with this person? Has this person been basically loyal to me in the past? Or has this person broke their promises many times? Does this person usually, when they speak to me, make me feel good? Or does this person usually not make me feel good? How do I feel when I walk away from a conversation with this person? You can sort of evaluate that and decide, well, oh, how much are you going to trust that person? But how do you do that with God? You know, you can't, you know, you can't have the same kind of conversation with God. You know, you don't, you don't really know what God's thinking. He's got, God is hidden today. He's in a state of Hester Punim. We can't really, you know, until Mashiach comes, God is, is sort of, you know, in a state of concealment. So how do, you, how do you trust God? How do you know? Well, how do you know he's good, right? You know, because that's really what the main aspect of Amunah is all about. The main aspect of Amuna is that God is good and that we can trust his goodness and that he wants to bestow goodness upon us 
and that uh, all everything that's being done is being done for our for our ultimate benefit. That's the that's the ultimate belief and faith in in, in God. That he's good, that he's kind, that he's loving. Okay? A person could believe in God, and many people do. But they may not believe that God is good all the time and that God is perfectly good, God is perfectly kind. And that even when he's um, sending trials and tribulations, that behind that is a chesed, behind that is his, uh, his kindness and his love. This is the test, you know, to believe that. Now, how do we get to that point? How do we reach that point? Well, this is what God waits for. He waits for us to relinquish our control and to take a chance on him to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to stop for a, just for a minute striving and pushing and trying to control life, I'm going to stop for a minute trying to battle with life and exert my will, right? And I'm going to just breathe easy, relax, center myself, try to let go, and try to feel that, the, that he's here. Try to experience that God's presence is presence is here now. Why should you do that? Well, maybe it's just because the greatest, smartest Jewish minds of all history chose to do that. <laughs> and that there are, I don't know, 300,000 some holy books um, written that, you know, that talk about doing it, talk about following the Torah, talk about self-nullification, talk about the wisdom of letting go and letting yourself be in closer communion with your, with your creator. Well, that's a, that's a pretty good reason to try it, you know, if so many great men and women in Jewish history say, hey, this is the best life. This is the life that leads to the most happiness this is the life that leads to the most joy and wisdom. This is the life that will uh, enable you to raise the healthiest and happiest of children. And this is the life that will enable you to continue your life after this physical life in an everlasting world of, of sublime joy that never ends. So, what do we do? We have to Relax, relax the muscles. We have to learn to relax the body, relax the muscles, to slow down the breathing, and to feel that pull, that force of return, where we are looking to know the truth, right? You're living in the present. You want to know the truth. You want to connect with God. You know? You want to be able to bring out all your best qualities, you don't want to feel alone anymore because really all of the main psychological symptoms that people deal with today is because they feel severed from their source. It's like cutting the roots of a tree with the, and they can't get the vitamins, they can't get the minerals anymore to be able to grow and to be able to stay alive spiritually. Spiritually, we need to stay alive. We can be alive physically, you know, just like a tree can stay alive for a while. You cut the tree... You cut the roots and it still looks like a tree for a while. It's still brown and the leaves are going to be green for a while. But it's dying. We know it's dying. So we have to be able to practice this kind of self-nullification on a very personal basis in our daily lives. Then Hashem takes a look at you and he says, Hey, look, I see you're trying to relax. You're trying to let go of negative emotions. Wow, that's fantastic, because you know what negative emotions are? It's the opposite of faith. When a person's angry, or fearful, or jealous, that person is showing God what? I don't believe in you. 
or if a person is self-persecuting. That's another form of arrogance, quiet arrogance, that indicates to God, hey, you know what? I don't believe in you. I don't believe that you have a good plan for me. I don't believe it. That's why I'm not happy. I'm not happy with what's going on. Okay, <laughs> things are not always easy. It's not always easy to go with the flow of what's going on. But that's what God wants to see us try to do, to be able to let go and go with the flow and accept. And when we do that, he gives us special power and special abilities to find his good that's hidden, even in what we look at as something that isn't looking so good. That is, when you've got that, you've really got a muna. And when you've got that, you feel that connection that, you know, that people have to go to Shea or Yankee Stadium to get, and they can only get it, you know, maybe in the last game of the World Series when they're finally that everything works out and you have a win. And even then, how long does it last? Or when you win the lottery and you feel great for a day or two, but then the person has to go back to his marital problems or his troubles with his kids, and the money went, he won in the lottery or the new car he just got just doesn't sustain him, right? We're talking about something that can sustain you all the time, that can make you happy every second of the day, where you can take with you, wherever you are, wherever you go, whoever you're with, a feeling that is better than anything else there is. You cannot find a person who is feeling close with God, a, feel, a person who's living in harmony with, with, with Hashem, will tell you that, it, that you can't get this feeling from any other source. There's nothing else like it. There's nothing else like it. And this is the, uh, this goes with a person forever. It's complete, it's what's called Netzach. It's a, it's an eternal type of victory that you take with you every, into the next world. So, how do we know when we're losing our connection with God? We know it when we enter, when we start to feel stressed out. We start, as soon as we start to feel angry at the kids, you start to feel you're, you know, you're losing your positive focus on life. You gotta stop, take a deep breath, and you gotta realize, okay, time to get back, time to get reconnected. If a person, if you make this your number one priority, not only will you never go so off, you're never gonna go into violence, you're gonna, you, you're not even going to go into sadness. You're going to be able to stay connected all the time, enjoy, which is really what life is all about. In fact, one of Hashem's names, he has many names, but one of his names is Simcha, which means joy. So if you come back to joy, you're also coming back to Hashem. You're coming back to him. It's a way of returning. It's another way of returning. All negative emotions are a lack of emuna. It seems so simple. Positive emotions, that's emuna. Right? Positive emotions, that's Hashem. Hashem is good. Hashem only sends things that are good. Anything that's not good, we know isn't coming from Hashem. It's coming from the other side. We don't want to get be connected with that. We want to stay connected only to good things, things that make us, you know, you're going to live longer. You're going to have more health, more happiness. How many studies show that a person who worries and has stress has a shorter life and is more prone to illness, and so on and so forth. So we have, to, we have to go with the wisdom of the ages. And that is that, hey, look, everybody knows positive thinking is better than negative thinking. You don't have to be a Torah observant Jew to believe that. Many cultures didn't believe in that. But what's the difference here? The difference is, how, how do you define what's positive thinking? How do you define what's positive behavior? 
Well, you have Torah standards of what's positive thinking and behavior, and you have the non-Torah world that says, okay, anything goes. You know, Yom, uh, the, what is it called? Southern Decadence Day, where in New Orleans, once a year, any person, any sin that a person wants to commit out in the public view is, uh, it's okay, and the, the police even turn away. Okay, we don't define that as fun, as positive. That's, that's not the kind of joy that the Torah defines as even joy. They think they're happy, but they're depressed while they're doing it. They think that they feel excited, but at the same time, this, their souls are being zapped, and they're feeling shrunken and smaller and smaller by the moment. So, when a person seeks the truth, he's also going to connect to Hashem. Chasam HaKadosh Baruch Hu Emes. The seal, the sign of Hashem is truth. Imagine a king when he writes his name on a royal document. How does he sign his name? Or what does, his, what does it say on his stamp? Well, Hashem, the king of kings, saw, he stamps everything Aleph Mem Saf, which spells Emes, which is truth. That's how he signs his name. When you look for truth, you have him. He comes right in. When you nullify yourself and make yourself more empty of foreign, strange, secular ideas and secular um, aspirations, materialistic aspirations, um, Hashem sees an open vessel and He comes into it. You're an open vessel, and you're opening and emptying yourself for Hashem. Hashem comes, boom, right in. He wants to be with you. He wants to dwell inside of you. He sees you're opening your heart to Him. You're letting go of anger. You're letting go of resentments. You let go of anger. You let go of resentments. You just made more room inside your heart for Hashem to come in. You let go of trying to change your spouse, change your children. You get let go of lecturing and trying to be, you know, everybody's rabbi or everybody's rebbitzin. You stop judging people, even in your thoughts. You've just opened up more space inside of you for Hashem to come in, and He comes in. And how do you know what's the proof? Try it yourself, your own your own personal experience will be your best research study, you know? Work on yourself. Try it. Let Hashem in. Learn to be more relaxed. Learn about techniques and strategies that will enable you to be more relaxed. And then see how Hashem comes. He comes to you. He lives with you. He stays with you. You have more mazel, better mazel, better luck. You know? More opportunities come your way. Situations open up before you. You meet new people. You get phone calls that you weren't getting before. You get new opportunities. You get new ideas that come into your mind. Where is it coming from now? Why is this sudden influx coming now and not before? Because now Hashem sees you're ready for it. He sees that you're willing to shed that skin of narcissism. You, you're willing to shed that skin of feeling... Like you're, you know a little better than most people. You know, you have more, uh, you've got the edge. You, you sort of, you know, superior to others. Once you realize that you're not, once you relinquish that, then Hashem gives you such connections with people. He gives you such satisfactions from relationship. The qualitative experience of relationship just gets so much better. Because now you're coming down, you're being part of us. You're being part of the everybody. You've got two feet in the camp, so to speak. You know, you make yourself normal and regular. You don't have to excel. You don't have to be special. When a person 
has that feeling that they have to be special, that they have to be significant, then they're vulnerable. Because if some, you know, crazy, you know, terrorist takes and says, you know, here, here's a gun, you know, here's a gun, shoot, shoot Jewish people, shoot, shoot women, shoot gays. You know what? You don't have any other way. The person doesn't have any other way of feeling good about themselves. They're going to fall for that baloney. So we have to be able to get it in healthy ways. That's the extreme. I mean, it goes to Islamic terrorism. And what was the refuah? Okay, we were going back to the, the Alkit Shimoni that Islam was supposed to get a refuah, a cure. Well, really, the truth is, if you go back eight years to the year 2008, when Barack Obama was, uh, <clears throat> what was it? Uh, Barack Obama was, uh, yeah, he was, he was elected in, in 2008. That was the opportunity. Barack Obama had the ability, he had, he was, God gave him more power than anyone on earth at that time. He was welcomed into office. He had the Senate, he had the Congress, he had the court. He had a, a power base with which he could have helped to bring more peace between the Islamic world and the Jewish world, Christian world. But he didn't do that, right? Barack Obama, who's ideologically a Muslim, created a situation that empowered, just the reverse, it empowered the, um, the, the Muslim terrorists to kill more Jews than, you know, left and right. So he hurt Jewish people and he hurt the Muslim people also because he, he could have, if he would have pursued truth, he would have been able to do something good in the world. He was basically a person who didn't have any qualifications to be president. We know that. He was a, he was a junior senator who had really done nothing yet in the Senate. Um, he had no, he had no experience, you know. He, Hashem picked him because he could speak to the Muslim people and he could help them to find their way back to the true meaning of life and to live in conformity with the true meaning of life in reality. He could have helped them to be able, their souls, to be able to find their way back to Abraham and back to, the, to, the, to their source in holiness and in Kedusha. But he didn't do that. And that's why his presidency was a complete failure. And that's why he'll have no legacy. And that's why we're looking still at a situation where those people didn't get the refuah that they still need to get. And they are slowly, lo they are not so slowly, they are losing ground more and more, losing their strength, those countries falling apart, um, even those terrorist groups now losing ground, ISIS losing ground, losing at least half of what they had in Syria. It's all falling apart now. He had a chance. <clears throat> he had a chance to, uh, to make that situation better. So we see that all people really want the truth. Really, everybody, we're all brothers. We all want the truth. We all want to find our way back <clears throat> to that state that 
we had pre-creation where we were all connected. And this is where we're holding now. We need to be able to um, um, <clears throat> how do we get there? The way we're going to do it at this point is mainly, as I said before, working on ourselves. By working on our individual selves, you're bringing more of God's light into the world. By working on your faith, by being a calmer person, a less judgmental person, a softer person, a person who devotes more time to spiritual pursuits than materialistic pursuits, where you try to at least lean more towards that, to have that as a desire. Even if you can't do more Torah learning now, even if you can't give more charity now, if you have the desire to do that, sometimes God gives you credit for it as if you've actually accomplished it already. So having those goals, that's how you're going to fix the world. That's how we're going to all join together and bring Mashiach very, very soon. Because at this point now, our rabbis tell us he's essentially around the corner. Um, if you have, by the way, a, uh, a way of seeing our team that's out there, our Breslov Israel team, um, you know, check out the website, see where they're, where they're at, what city they're in now. I believe they're on their way to Chicago, or maybe they're in Chicago by now. Um, go watch uh, Rabbi Eliezer Brody, Rabbi Yonatan Galad. Listen to the teachings of our rabbi and our teacher, Rabbi Shalom Arish, through, through, them, through them in English. And start today, you know. Start today to work on not only knowing Amuna in your mind, but demonstrating Amuna in your life, in the way you live, by being a calmer, kinder, nicer person. In doing this, we're not only going to make America great again, as Donald Trump says, but we're going to make God great again. We're going to bring God back into the world, and we're going to bring Mashiach, and he's going to come here to Yerushalayim, Ir HaKodesh, the holy city, and he's going to build the holy temple, the final permanent holy temple, very, very soon. May it happen very, very soon, and may we all meet on such an occasion. Mm -hmm.